Thank you for the introduction, Brad. It's so great to be back here in Athens. Um, we had a wonderful sketching session last night. It was great to get um, back into the art school environment. And thanks, Jean, for putting that on. And thanks, Brad and, and company, for creating a great meeting again this year. It's wonderful to have a local meeting that we can go to, um, one day event to really celebrate medical illustration. So I want to recognize some of my collaborators, Kelly Braun, who couldn't be here, and Aaron Latif, they are medical doctors in, at Augusta University in the OBGYN department. Also Ryan Reed, um, his research is also contributed and um, contained in this um, presentation. He's going to be helping pass out materials because we've got lots to show you, lots to pass around. So for the past few years, I've been working with the obstetrics and gynecology department to create custom simulators for the residency program and um, working in collaboration with the medical scholars program, but also our master's degree students in the medical illustration program. So we're going to show some project examples, some of our process, the materials we use so that you might be able to adapt that into a workflow for yourself, and also some low fidelity models. So if you don't have the money to purchase silicone, what can you do on a budget. And so for my role through the Medical Scholars Program, um, my main project was to create a bladder repair model for the OBGYN department. Now cystotomy repair is a required surgical milestone for their residents to complete before graduation. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of students do not get enough experience with practicing this. Um, so they previously in the OBGYN department created a low fidelity model, uh, which is shown here using a whoopee cushion and shelf liner and some saran wrap, uh, which, yeah, it worked well for them for several years, but obviously they, now that they had um, a medical illustration resource, they wanted to up the fidelity and improve the model. Um, additionally, it was not watertight, which is something that would obviously be a benefit for a bladder. Now, what's on the market now on the right is um, a model from the Sindaver company. Um, unfortunately, it is over $300 for one model. And as you can imagine, for a residency program with about 10 students, that can be quite expensive, especially with programs with lower budgets. Um, additionally, it's not a hollow organ as well. So our project was to create the best of both worlds, to create an inexpensive, reusable, watertight, moderate fidelity bladder model with visible ureteral jets. So as you can imagine, if you've done any mold making or sculpture, how do you create a hollow structure with a tiny little opening? Because, I mean, conceptually you can think maybe you'd have a mold piece that would go inside um, and be able to pull it out, but you can't do that through a urethra. Very tiny. So I had some ideas. I wasn't making any promises. So we just started a process of discovery throughout the summer. And my first idea was to take a balloon and put it on a rotary caster and take some silicone and put it on. Um, and slowly it would cure over time. Well, that didn't work, as you can see here. And the fidelity isn't great. Um, but again, I wasn't promising a lot. So uh, failure number one. <laughs> failure number two was to take silicone that is a putty-like consistency. So this is the example here. It's a two-part system. You mix it together. It creates a putty. You add pigment to it. You run it through a pasta roller, and you get sheets of silicone that you can then lay upon other structures. Well, we tried that with a balloon. It didn't set up. There was something with the balloons that inhibited cure. So that didn't work. Um, so <laughs> I was resistant but realized that, well, OK, we're going to have to make a mold, and we're going to have to see if the concept of silicone healing itself, silicone adhering to itself, would work for a watertight model. And so um, Megan sculpted up this shape as a starting shape to work with the clients and make sure that the size and um, features were what they wanted. And then we 3D scanned it and decided that we were going to have to make a, a mold that had a core and then cut the core out and then reseal the uh, object, the bladder, with silicone. We didn't know if that was going to work. Again, I wasn't making a lot of promises. Um, but this is just my back of the post-it note sketch to explain this concept to, to Megan and our client, who was, Aaron, uh, who was uh, Kelly Braun, and um, took the 3D scan of the shape to begin with and then made modifications to make it um, more to client specifications. But we went ahead and 3D printed out the positive shape, but also the negative shape that would create the core, because they wanted high fidelity. Um, you know, if they could get it, they wanted to see the anatomical features inside of the bladder. And so 
by 3D printing both parts, they were able to take a look, um, provide some feedback on the um, ureteral orifices and, and fidelity. So we did um, digitally make this. Um, I felt that the ability to traditionally make this would be very challenging because there could potentially be a lot of changes made throughout the process. So a digital process is what I used, um, made a four-part mold where that core was suspended inside the mold to allow you to cast two layers of silicone. One layer was a muscularis layer, which was another thing they added. As, as we were able to achieve new goals, they said, well, can you make a two-layer model? And we were able to by casting one color of silicone and then another color of silicone to create a double layer. And so here's the final model. We also have additional live models in the front. Um, and so you can see the anatomical features as well, which I have labeled. Um, I especially want to point out at the bottom right image, the two layers, you can see kind of a color difference. And so it included all the corporate, appropriate anatomy that was requested by the client. And so once we made the model, we needed to test it and see how the residents liked it. And so they took a two-part pre-test and post-test um, with identifying anatomical features of the bladder and how they felt about um, doing the procedure before and after the test. And so you can see on the left image just the setup that each resident had before them, including all of the surgical instruments that they would actually use with this procedure. And then on the right is the setup with all eight stations. And at each station, we had two residents that each performed their own simulation and then switched off. And so this video is showing one of the residents performing the bladder repair. Um, so they had to perform a double layer suture with the model. And so you can see that the model is holding up pretty well to the sutures. So it, it does a good job of simulating real bladder tissue. After the sutures are in place, they need to make sure that they did an appropriate job with the closure. And that is done, shown in the image on the right, by injecting the bladder with, um, with a water through um, a syringe. And so normally this would be about 60 cc's of water in the actual procedure, but for our model it held up to about 30 cc's of water, which is still appropriate to see the dilation of the bladder as it filled with water. Um, and it was in fact watertight, which was one of our main goals of this project. And so as a bonus feature of the model, it was also effective for cystoscopy. So you can see the anatomical structures, um, including the trigone and the ureteral or orifices, and in a second, I will be demonstrating the ureteral jets, which shows that there's no obstruction in the ureters. And so again, like I said before, most of the residents had little to no prior experience with this simulation and performing the procedure in real life. However, it is a required surgical milestone for their training. This bladder model improved both their um, IDing the anatomy of the bladder and their confidence in performing the procedure in the future. The residents also agreed the model was very realistic and did an excellent job of demonstrating the anatomy and the procedure. Now you can see on the right, um, each resident performed a bladder repair, and so there was two residents per test. Um, and then when a client would like to reuse the bladders in the future, all we need to do is remove the sutures, apply a clear layer of silicone, and it's good to go for future uses. Now, for cost analysis, I had mentioned earlier that the Sindaver model on the right was over $300 for one model, and it isn't even hollow. Um, our model, excluding labor and machine costs, came out to about $25 per model, which was a significant difference. So for a second task we were um, assigned for the summer was improving a labor dilation and effacement model um, for use for the OBGYN Center's um, boot camp for medical students to learn basic OBGYN procedures before seeing real patients when they go on their third and fourth year rotations. Um, so again, the goal, like before, was to make an inexpensive, reusable, model that showed all stages of labor and effacement. So this included about um, 17 or so models. That was moderate fidelity, and currently it's being tested um, in Augusta, so we'll be getting results soon on that. So this is the low fidelity trainer um, that they were using previously before they approached us. And so you can see it's PVC, a PVC elbow pipe for the base, um, some craft foam for the vulva, an embroidery hoop to hold it all together, and some cotton batting and clay on the inside. And so again, like I said before, we wanted to improve on the fidelity and expand the sizes of the dilations and effacements that they had to offer for testing. 
So again, they just approached this, can you improve this model? So it was a lot of trial and error on ways to improve it. Um, originally, we added a more realistic vulva on the left, but the silicone was too stiff for adequate ma manipulation. Um, additionally, the sponge on the right that was used, it was just a car sponge, um, you know, it's kind of a, um, a rectangular shape to create the cervix dilation rings. It was too small for the eight to 10 centimeter dilations um, that can be on the larger end. Um, additionally, we found that the PVC was too small for this purpose as well. So we went to um, a local hardware store and we found um, this bluish plumbing pipe, um, the PVC pipe that was a lot more aesthetically pleasing um, with the help of some handyman, my dad. Um, he helped uh, cut the PVC, which it was a lot more difficult than we realized. Um, so in the future, if we were to replicate this, I think a bucket would be very adequate and you could spray paint it any color you wanted. Um, but it, it looked, it turned out really well. I also have the final model at the bottom. Um, so for production of the sponges for the cervical rings, uh, we found these foam cushion, cushions that were used for um, just seating purposes. And we were able to use um, circle templates that we just made on Microsoft Word to get more exact um, dilation sizes. Um, and so by using the templates and the cushion, we were able to get more uniform products at the end. So. You know, again, as we became successful with each step of development, the client um, thought, well, when you have a fully dilated um, uh, lady in labor, you can feel the fontanelle. And so uh, we needed to create fontanelles. And that was done by sculpting in clay. Um, we used a Chabant clay. It's a soft clay. I'm going to pass this around so you can feel it. Um, I love this clay for very quick sculpts um, that you just want to get a basic shape. You can smooth it with some alcohol, um, some High, um, high percentage alcohol, 99% alcohol. But we built a wall around the clay model and poured plaster in to create a dump mold. And that's just a quick and easy mold making process to then pour silicone into that shape and cast the fontanelle to insert in the model. Um, same process was used for the vulva model and um, a, a mold was made and silicone was cast into to those shapes. And for assembling the final models, um, we did a two-part process. So on the left, the donut-shaped foam piece, that was glued to the vulva at the top. And then the right circular piece of foam was glued to the, um, the cervix dilation ring. And so by having a two-part model, the pieces can be interchanged so that where the final models, which are shown here, um, you can have multiple uses and when you're testing, no one student will memorize, oh, well, this vulva went with this dilation. You can switch them out. Um, so these are the assembled products. Note also the different colors of the vulvas. Um, we added extra shades for diversity, which is always important. Um, additionally, we added labels for the answer keys for the back. That way an instructor doesn't have to take apart the whole model just to see what the answer is. So um, I'm going to do a survey of materials. So you're familiar with the different types of materials. We've been talking about materials, but what do you actually use? So I have a handout um, that I have copies of with me, um, but also we're going to send out the handout so you'll have a reference guide for these materials. Um, and then something um, also to note with the, the labor trainer um, model was, I lost my train of thought on that one. Um, let's just talk about materials. So with materials, um, whenever you want to basically duplicate a structure, uh, alginate is a wonderful material to do so. It's quick, it's inexpensive, but it is non-permanent. Alginate is made um, based off of seaweed. It has a pancake batter consistency. You can pour that over your object and very quickly within about 10 minutes have a mold to pour other materials into. Alginate. Um, because it's a pancake batter consistency, I don't recommend it for the face. You can do it if someone is um, very trusting and very skilled. But AlgaSafe Acrobat is an alternative um, that you can use on the face that has fiber in it. And you put it on the face and it stays exactly where you put it. So um, those are a couple of alginate materials that I'm using. Um, silicone is another method for duplicating. It's very expensive though, so you would only want to use silicone to duplicate something if you wanted to use it multiple times, if you wanted to be able to cast many of them. Um, but there's body double and dragon skin that will cure very fast, so it's a quick duplication method as well. 
Polyvinyl siloxane is a dental impression material. You may have come in contact with it if you have ever had any dental work. Um, it's a sterile material. It's great for more medical uses, um, for casting teeth. It's what I use for facial prosthetics. It, it is very expensive, though, so I, I don't generally recommend it as a, a matter of course using that. Um, it would be much better, better to use alginate or silicone. Um, stone and plaster is also another method. So. This is the basic method of, of duplication with stone. This is not great for anything that has undercuts or anything that is going to be very hard to get out of the mold. So if you had a, a solid piece that was hard um, cast into this, it would be hard to even get it out. So um, I only recommend stone if you um, are not going to have undercuts. But it is a permanent duplication material. So sculpting. We've talked about clays. Um, the Chavant clay is going around. And this is an example of monster clay. Um, monster clay, you can melt and pour into an impression, a cast. I keep staring at this side. I feel bad. Um, and um, we've been working with, and Ryan Reed um, has been working with Giancarlo Brent Brajdic, um, who is a special effects specialist and mold maker who recommended actually mixing um, monster clay and Chavant together to get really great properties of um, detail, but also um, smoothness. And um, wax, I prefer wax as a material whenever I'm making facial prosthetics. Because as you can imagine, clay will deform if you accidentally drop something on it. Wax has a little bit more forgiveness for that sort of thing. So I have a couple of different waxes. This is a base plate wax, this pink wax. It's used in dental um, material. And then this is a um, wax that I use for facial prosthetics. It has a little bit more beeswax in it, so you can feel the softness, so if you compare the two. But ultimately, you have to use heat to um, sculpt and metal tools. Um, as I mentioned before, high-consistency silicone is another sculpting material where you make directly um, the object that you want in silicone. So this is a two-part putty that you mix together and run through a pasta roller with pigment. And um, it's used in facial prosthetics, but it's also used in um, limb prosthetics very often. So it's a, a well-tested material that you can really have a lot of control over. Uh, and, and then the base um, product that you can use, you can find in art supply stores, is polymer clay. So if you want to get started with something and um, don't really know what to use, polymer clay is an, an option. And that will harden up with heat, but if you don't want to heat it up, you can make a mold of it. So I'm going to take a step back and talk about basic mold making. We talked about the dump mold with alginate and plaster, where you can have a cup of material, whether it be silicone or alginate, and place your object in that cup, and the hollow space creates a space um, for wax or even silicone poured into the space. The other option is creating a, a, brit, a wall around the object and pouring material over it. And this is good and really best for an object that you don't need detail on both sides. If you do need detail on both sides, then you need to make a two-part mold, which is a little bit more complicated, where you have to take your object and actually embed it in clay to hold it up and um, then pour material over it after you've created a wall around. And then you have to flip it over and do the same thing. So you've got two sides of the mold. And um, that's best for a rigid mold. But if you find that you're going to have a very complex structure, so imagine, imagine a hand that has a lot of undercuts and potential to lock into your mold, you wouldn't want to pour plaster over that. Um, so you can use silicone, which is soft and pliable, and then some other structure as a mother mold. And so um, uh, that little diagram demonstrates a mother mold for a two-part mold. Um, so those are your basic mold-making options. And materials I recommend would be dental stone um, for really um, strong molds. But hydrocal is also an inexpensive plaster that's available. You can use silicone, um, body double, and dragon skin. Mold Star and, and Platzil are the ones that we're using. Um, it is more expensive to make molds with, so be aware of that. An inexpensive option would be urethane rubber. It's also flexible like silicone, so similar properties to silicone, but less expensive. Um, but when you mix the two together, um, there is some more chemical fumes with urethane, so you need to be aware of that and have proper ventilation, whereas si silicone does not create um, fumes. So we don't 
currently use urethane rubber. Um, but they do have a brush on 40, which allows you to paint on top of your object to create a nice uh, flexible mother mold. Uh, Rioflex and, and the Poly 7445 are more of the pour on um, materials rather than brushing. Another option is urethane plastic. So you can mix two parts together and get a plastic that sets up in really a, a very limited amount of time, a, a couple of minutes even. So I'm going to pass around this model. This, this shows um, the urethane plastic, plaster, and then uh, a, wa uh, a clay, the Shemon not Shemonster, but the, the monster clay material. So you can see um, the three different materials and then a mother mold and a, a daughter mold for silicone. Um, but I used uh, plastic whenever I want really high detail because it's so strong, this urethane plastic is. So this is an example of how I took a very soft sculpture of the vulva and duplicated it very quickly by creating a wall around it and pouring the, the plastic in. And so I was able to then um, get multiple duplications off of this piece um, because it was so hard and, and it was fast. So that's, that's the value of the urethane plastic. Um, something I forgot to mention about the urethane rubber. Urethane rubber can inhibit the cure of silicone. So you must test urethane rubber with any silicone you're planning to use. So be aware of that. It's a great inexpensive material, but um, worst case scenario, you're done and then you're going to cast silicone in it and it doesn't work. So always test your materials before you use them. And then lastly, plaster bandage, which you can see an example going around um, with the cast of the face. And then um, casting material, so pretty much almost anything that you make a, a mold with, you can cast into a structure. Um, plaster, silicone, urethane rubber. Pigment can be added to silicone and urethane rubber, and even the urethane plastic pigment can be added. Um, they do fake bronze casting with this urethane plastic, so um, a lot of fun color options for ur the urethanes. Um, and then for urethane plastic and plaster, you can spray it with a um, acrylic primer and allows you to paint on top of it. So if you want your final object to be hard, there's no reason why you can't paint on plaster or the urethane um, plastic as a final product. So I keep throwing around this word called durometer. And um, just to, to take a step back and talk about what durometer is, I created this um, diagram to help explain my understanding and, and my recommendations for different durometers for different um, structures. So um, we can all kind of visualize the old number two pencil rubber eraser that has a 40 durometer. Um, so we would say fibroids and cartilage are, are around that and your auto tire is even harder. So the higher the number, the harder the material. The lower number, the soft softer the material. So very elastic skin, the skin that is going around for the vulva, that's a 00-50, which is a very soft material, less than one. Um, we've got a uterus up here that's a 10. And um, we even have some fat examples, which I'll talk about in a minute, that's even less than, than um, 0050. So something to, to keep in mind, you talk about 3D printing. Why don't we just 3D print these models? Currently, there are not 3D printing materials that are um, high fidelity enough. The, the materials are not able to simulate the realism. And so, for example, um, the NinjaFlex, which is the softest flexible filament that's extruded, uh, that's still at an 80 durometer. And so I have an example of that. Um, this is a model that was made by Lindsay Ekema, um, 3D printing with the NinjaFlex material. So I'll pass this around so you can feel what uh, a uh, 80 durometer is, it's, it's a partial, partial print. Uh, and Form 2 has a new resin, so I'll talk about the Form 2 printer in a minute, but there's a 3D printer um, that allows you to print a flexible resin, um, and it's a commercial grade desktop printer. And this material is great, and Ryan's gonna be um, incorporating it into his simulation model. And um, so I will send out this diagram if you want it for reference. If, you, if you're just not sure which silicone to choose, this is a good um, overall reference. But there, there are no 3D printing materials out there yet that can do what silicone can do. So this is why you 
should incorporate medical sculpture into any simulation program and not only rely on 3D printing. Though I do love 3D printing. Um, TAS 6 and now Form 3 is the most current model of the resin-based printer. So TAS 6 is the filament-based printer that you're seeing the material go around. And I've actually got examples here. So resin-based printer and a filament-based printer of the same object. So we'll pass that around so you can see the two different materials. But if you are running, um, if something goes wrong with 3D printing, because something will always go wrong, um, these are great, great, pretty stable printers. But and I can usually fix them in a day or something, or a day or two or three. But if you're on a deadline, 3D hubs and Make XYZ are great options for outsourcing printing to local individuals with machines, and you can get them print in about a day or two. Um, there are maker spaces you can pay a fee to join. Um, and use their printers, and then even your local library may be an option. So this is a, a, a mold that I made for $170 um, that was outsourced. Um, so talking about special effects materials, we have, um, I have up here, so you may have seen the horrible, or the, the horror kit that I have up here, but um, one of the things that Ryan is exploring, his client wants realism and blood if the, um, Medical students get out of line and go a little too close to the jugular. Um, they want it to squirt blood and be as realistic as possible. So we have um, a blood kit uh, here um, that washes out very well. It's a commercial blood kit. <clears throat> but um, the expert that Ryan's been working with recommends uh, a DIY blood of Dawn soap, isopropyl alcohol, food coloring, glycerin to thicken it, and then a dietary fiber if needed to keep it from beading on the surface. So, so we have both of these up here, so during break, if you want to dip your finger in it, you're welcome to. <clears throat> the other special effects material is, um, is for fat. So um, Ryan wants realism in his fat, and so um, Johnny recommends Platsil 25 and a deadener added. When you add deadener, it essentially inhibits the cure of the silicone, making it very soft and sticky. So then you have to encapsulate it in a material called Baldies, which is the bald cap material. And so we have that here, and I will pass it around so you can touch it, because I know you want to. Um, but this is a, a great solution and provides a lot of realism for his simulation model. I'm looking forward to seeing that incorporated. All right. And so for the end of our talk, I just want to point out, we've discussed several methods to improve model fidelity using 3D printing and high quality materials, but low fidelity models still have their place and have a tremendous value, um, especially for clients that are new to the simulation world or um, don't have 3D printers accessible or don't have the budgets to use some of the nicer materials. So this is um, a model for a low fidelity per perennial laceration tear that the OBGYN department created before um, their collaboration with the medical illustration department. So it just uses a car sponge, um, a tampon applicator, and a rubber glove to simulate, um, yeah, very low cost, easy to use, um, and it worked for their needs at the time. Um, so several of these items can be found at even, say, the dollar store. Um, so it's a woolly ball, some balloons, a plastic maraca, and some press and seal, and that could be used to create a low fidelity ectopic pregnancy trainer. So the, the maraca is the uterus, the balloons are the fallopian tubes, and the little woolly balls are the ectopic pregnancies. So really, with just a little bit of imagination, you can create something like this that really works to serve the needs of the residents and provide instruction on a valuable teaching tool. Um, I would like to thank my department, the Department of Medical Illustration, um, for their support of this research, as well as the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology for their collaboration over the years. And um, the Medical Scholars Program, who supported Megan's research, and also Miller Singleton's research, who has worked with me in the past. The Augusta University Simulation Center is um, supporting Ryan's research and, um, and is a client um, for Ryan's project. The Greenbrat Library also provided um, many 3D prints this summer, so we're very thankful for that resource at Augusta University. And um, uh, Johnny Brajdic at Skull Asylum for his expertise in special effects. Um, to, Places that you can get these materials locally in Atlanta is Reynolds Advanced Materials, which was formerly the engineer guy, and Fox and Superfine in Fayetteville, which um, they, they cater to more of the, the true movie special effects materials, um, which are uh, polytech. So 
Um, if we look forward to answering any questions at the lunch break, and here's my email if you need it, and we'll send out handouts. Thank you. And I know there are a few models still floating around, so if you could get them all to, uh, let's see what corner, I guess this corner, eventually make their way there, that would be great. Thank you.